So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I'll start by just introducing myself. I'm mostly here for the pizza. Um, so and I'm gonna, Who isn't? And I'm right. going to listen uh, I'm gonna listen to Rod talk about uh, our project most of the time, but I'm sure I'll have an opportunity to, to chime in. So I'm Rod Lindgren. Um, I'm a faculty member in curriculum instruction in the um, College of Education. Um, I did want to say real quickly something fairly off topic, which is that um, the College of Education uh, requested many new uh, faculty hires for the um, upcoming uh, year. And uh, curriculum instruction, unfortunately, got approved for one. But we did get approved for a science education uh, faculty member. So, um, and I'm chairing that search. Barbara is on the search committee. Rob is the student representative on uh, that committee. And so starting possibly this semester, but for sure in the upcoming year, we're going to uh, have talks and opportunities to uh, meet with the candidates for those positions. So we really want to make sure that everybody um, here and um, really across campus is involved in that. Getting a good science education person for the college is going to be really, really important given some of our recent departures and retirements and, and those sorts of things. So please, please be on the lookout for, for those. So with that, I will turn it over to Rob. Can I ask Rob, yep. when, did the, when does the search close? The search closes November 15th. Okay. So yeah. So okay. Rel okay. relatively soon. But I actually, I actually have had inquiries. Good. Good. Yeah. And it, it has been posted. We're we're going to continue posting it uh, broadly to try to get lots of people. Okay. Great. And I'm Rob Wallen. You probably figured that out by now. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a graduate student in curriculum instruction, uh, studying science education. I and mean, I work with Dr. Lindgren um, and several other folks on the GRASP project. Uh, thank you very much to Misty for having us in today to share about the project. Um, I plan on taking the first part of the talk to tell you a little bit about our approach and our rationale. And the second part of the talk, I plan to talk about our progress in the design process thus far. And the bulk of that, I want to talk about the current year and heading into the future, um, because that's the sliver that I'm most interested in uh, taking for um, some of my dissertation research. And I have some pilot data to share, and hopefully we can ponder over. Um, and I've been in this group in the past and seen that there's really good conversations and discussions that happen. Um, so I hope along the way that we can have those uh, good conversations and discussions. Uh, I wanted to note, I threw my Twitter handle on there really quickly. Um, if you feel inclined, um, feel free to uh, snap pictures or uh, videos during the talk, except for the times where I show students on the screen. Um, those aren't to be distributed outside of uh, this room. Just thought I'd mention that. So speaking of conversations, um, I'd like you to actually turn to your neighbor or small group next to you and consider this question, um, come up with a, a brief answer. Um, why is it you think that we experience warm summers and cool winters? Take a minute to do that. Okay, I'll stop you there. I was able to walk around the room and eavesdrop a little bit. So I heard some of the things that you were saying. Um, now, this is a question that we ask students as part of the project, and we try to help them uh, come up with an explanation for this. Now, I'll argue that uh, those of us in this room uh, probably have a little bit more background knowledge than middle school students, especially in these topic areas. Um, but I want to make the case that uh, some of you I heard uh, pondering over what actually is the cause. And I heard some people um, rather sure. I heard some people um, postulating a few possibilities. The um, transition I want to make here is that uh, this question might seem like an easy question because it's often taught middle school and revisited even later on in formal schooling experiences. But this question isn't always as easy as it seems. And I want to show uh, a brief clip here. Uh, many of you have probably seen the video, A Private Universe. Um, but Recent graduates, some take a look at this. In astronomy. These are graduates from Consider, Harvard. Consider, for example, that the causes of the seasons is a topic taught in every standard curriculum. OK, um, I think the seasons happen because as the Earth travels around the sun, it gets nearer to the sun, um, which produces warmer weather and gets farther away, which produces colder weather. And, then, and hence the seasons. How hot it is or how cold it is at any given time of the year has to do with the 
the, the closeness of the Earth to the sun during the seasonal periods. The Earth goes around the sun. <laughs> and, and it gets hotter when we get closer to the sun, and it gets colder when we get further away from the sun. Okay, so what do we think about their ideas? Good ideas. Why do you think they're good? I think that they, I think if you're naive about, and by naive I mean you just don't, you haven't seen this before, thought about it before, I think that's a good first place to start with warmth and, and uh, cold. Proximity to a heat source versus um, means warmer and further away means cooler. Sure, if, you, if you've been by a hot pan or something on the stove or a campfire, those everyday experiences. You said if you haven't thought about it before. Now, the, this was filmed in the 1980s, uh, Harvard graduates. Um, I don't believe that they were uh, science specialists, um, but they had encountered the ideas likely before in their middle school uh, days. So what do we think about that? Okay, so it's something maybe they learned in middle school and haven't had to use since. I'll throw out another possibility that perhaps even in middle school, they didn't actually learn it all that well. We'll keep thinking about that um, as we move through. George. assumptions that we have every day and the facts that we're taught in elementary school. Um, all of them began by saying, the Earth goes around the sun. I think if they were asked, how do you know that? I, and I think a lot of us you know, were asked, how do, how do we know that? Somebody told us. Um, you know, what evidence presents itself to us that the Earth goes around the sun is pretty problematic. Um, which may, yeah. But but yeah, I've thought of, yeah I've seen this and, and I I really feel uh, that uh, getting back to the I think naive assumptions is important for us to, to validate the naive assumptions and to say that's part of learning. So I see myself in those those people a lot more than I did when I initially saw it and, and had that sense of Harvard grad saying that, you know. Yeah, that's interesting to share. And a lot of times, um, so you use the phrase naive uh, conceptions. A lot of times people use the phrase misconceptions, alternative ideas. Uh, when possible, I like to just call these ideas. Uh, they might not be the normative or canonical ideas, um, but they're ideas and they're a way of making sense of something. Um, if I do say misconceptions, know that um, I'm aligned more with George in, in thinking that um, these are ideas to be respected. But with that in mind, I want to make a point here that developing an understanding is very difficult for many topics in science. Uh, causes of the seasons is one example of that. Um, and this shows that these are not new problems, but they're persistent problems. So the argument I want to make is these persistent challenges warrant the need to explore new approaches, new ways to help students learn and engage with these topics. Drum roll. Uh, hence the, the need for our, our project, GRASP. Uh, don't try too hard to figure out what this acronym is here. Um, if you went only by the first letters, I guess it would be more like GAS. But, um, we thought it might be better to go with GRASP. Gesture Augmented Simulations for Supporting Explanations. Um, this is an NSF project that's a collaboration between the College of Ed at uh, our university and the Concord Consortium. Um, we've got our website on there. Check it out. Um, 
the components that we're working with here, uh, first of all, we said this is for supporting explanations. Um, so rather than thinking about memorizing discrete facts, we're trying to help students build some coherent explanations of different topics. Um, this is something that's emphasized in a lot of the science education reform documents. Um, one component is simulations. There's been numerous studies, uh, not just individual studies, but literature reviews, meta-analyses um, that have all agreed that simulations generally are very good for science learning. What is less known are details about their design and how they're used. So part of our study is to look at the design and um, part that I'm especially excited about is looking at how they're used in classrooms. Now part of that design is to integrate gesture recognition and uh, gesture is something that's really interesting. As you all were giving your explanations earlier, I saw a lot of you gesturing. Whether you realize it or not, it's something that we do all the time to help us communicate, to help us make sense. Um, there's a, a very influential study that starts to look at this in education, and it makes the argument that, yes, gesture is pervasive, but it, considering how pervasive it is, it's understudied in educational contexts. So a little bit more about gestures, um, just to give it a little bit more common ground and background knowledge. Uh, the gestures that we're interested in the project are representational gestures. So probably the most common gestures that you're familiar with are deictic gestures of pointing at things. And don't get me wrong, those can be very important for establishing uh, shared understandings, uh, very important in teaching and learning. But the ones that we're interested in are representational gestures. Um, which in some ways are more congruent with the concepts that are being discussed. We'll have some uh, illustrations of this uh, coming up. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is a proposed role for gestures in teaching and learning is that they can uh, sort of connect or link multiple layers of content. Um, so especially things that are seen, uh, things that we experience, and those theoretical things that um, we don't have direct access to. So for example, molecules and how molecules might play a role in, in a phenomenon that's observed, or light rays, for example. And I wanted to highlight that uh, there are plenty of studies that have looked at how gestures are used uh, while students are trying to make sense of various science topics. Uh, there are studies in astronomy, chemistry, geology. These are with different age learners. Um, so this is a pervasive phenomenon as students are trying to talk and make sense of uh, different science topics, they gesture. So we want to go uh, one step uh, beyond that and not just look at the fact that students will gesture when we're talking about these topics, um, but we want to look at how can we use technologies to cue certain gestures that hopefully would be productive in students thinking and developing understanding of some topics. So you see our basic setup here in the image on the screen. Uh, the device right here is the Leap Motion, and it just plugs in via USB to a computer. It's supported on uh, Windows and Mac machines. And you see there's a simulation on the screen. Um, what might not be readily apparent is that this device is able to track um, various hand movements, and those are used as the interaction mechanisms for our simulations. Yeah, the Leap is commercially available. It's been coming down in price. Um, right now, they're uh, starting to focus some of their attention on mounting it on VR displays. As VR is picking up, um, this gives the ability to track hands in virtual reality spaces as well. It's come down from, what, a couple of years ago, it was closer to 100 or something like that. So um, that's a, a very good point to, to bring up is that um, you can think back, I was trying to think back, what movie was it? Maybe it was something like Born Identity or something. You can imagine these various sci-fi movies that show people in front of these large displays and they're using gestures to interact with them. And I remember at the time, 
uh, thinking, wow, that seems so far off and in the future. And here we are, um, these technologies have come of age. You've seen things like the Kinect that can do that for video game systems. Um, Intel is putting something out called RealSense that's getting packaged with a lot of laptops that are coming out, also a USB device. Um, so these technologies are coming here, they're becoming low cost, which gives us an opportunity to use them in classroom settings and think about how we might create some novel experiences for students. Uh, why are they interested in making the hardware? A lot of it seems to be for entertainment purposes, gaming, that kind of thing. Um, there's integration in operating systems is just another way to um, sort of navigate the, the space. Very few of them seem to be interested in the educational possibilities. Is it, it, that's just tracking the hand. There's not a cuff or anything that's part of the sensors? Correct. Okay. Yep. So I wanted to also take a moment to uh, talk a little bit about the overarching views that frame some of our work. And to do this, I wanted to present uh, two views of cognition that we can contrast. And the first one, I think, is the most pervasive view of cognition. I know it's the one that I default uh, to in, in thinking about cognition. And that is, um, it's very easy to think about cognition as something that's in the mind and the mind being associated with the brain and the brain uh, being compared to a computer that processes information, that processes uh, symbols, for example. Um, and don't get me wrong, that is a very productive view for a lot of things. Um, but there's also views of cognition that look beyond the connection of mind to brain and say that mind goes beyond brain, involves the entire body, and not only that, put the little picture of the stepper here to try to uh, make the point that um, it's not just the body in isolation, but the body in the context of the environment. So we can say that this uh, first view I presented is disembodied. Um, this stems from a lot of traditional views in Western thought that um, separate the mind and body and, and say that the body is uh, inferior to the mind. And the second view I presented, I think we can uh, assign this label of an embodied view that looks at and takes seriously the role of the body in understanding and thinking and learning. But I also need to make a caveat here. And this is my soapbox moment for the day. If there's one thing that you remember from this, uh, then let this be it. And this also might be the most controversial thing that I say. From uh, conversations with teachers, from seeing some of the literature um, that's out there, whenever you start talking about using the body, uh, the first thing that comes up, the thought that comes up, is learning styles and kinesthetic learners. I want to make the point, make the argument, that when we're talking about embodied cognition, we're not talking about kinesthetic learning as part of learning styles. Learning styles has been debunked. Um, the, the thought that someone is a visual learner and uh, that's the only way that they're going to be able to learn best uh, hasn't been supported by empirical evidence. Um, it's it's a, a very tempting notion, though, I think, and it's, it's taken us to some places at recognizing that if a student's having difficulties learning, maybe it's not with that student, um, but with different approaches and, and that sort of thing. Uh, Howard Gardner himself, um, who's uh, championed multiple intelligences that argue that there's not one intelligence, but multiple intelligences, and that you might be more intelligent in one area and not in the other, um, has lamented that his work has been confused with learning theories um, for the, the reasons that I mentioned. So I wanted to throw that out there. Um, when we're talking about use of the body, we're not talking about uh, arbitrary uh, gestures, in our case, that are being used. And um, we're trying to talk about gestures that are congruent uh, with the concepts that are to be learned. Well, and one of the unfortunate consequences of the debunking of kinesthetic learning is that a lot of people have said, okay, well, then body-based, hands-on types of activities aren't as effective, so let's just go back to focusing on the cognitive stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're trying to show is that there are actually really good applications for physical interaction and physical engagement with the learning environment, but it needs to be very principled and it needs to be well thought out and, and getting at this idea of congruency that Rob said, that thinking about what are the congruent ways that people can move 
that are going to support the conceptual views that we're trying to get. Can I ask for some clarity? Because I have heard this. Maya Israel has also mentioned that the Bernie Strauss has been debunked. But I haven't been clear precisely on what it is that's being debunked. No one, I think, it would deny that different um, approaches to learning a concept probably enhance, and that some may be more responsive to one approach to an idea as another. I'm, I've heard my colleague Janet Sylvester say a number of times, if I can grasp it, I can think about it. Mm -hmm. So would you say, you know, Janet's a, 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 am I erroneous in saying, well, she's a visual, you know, learner. Uh, oh, but <coughs> I'll tell you specifically what's been debunked. What's been debunked is the notion that if you diagnose somebody with one of these different learning styles, you can explain the assessments that exist out there and then teach that person catering to that specific style. They don't learn any better than anybody else who is taught by that specific style. So it's, it's not saying that there aren't preferences, that there aren't conditions under which people might be more comfortable with the material that's being gained. But if you try to isolate isolate groups and teach them to that style, it doesn't have any any okay. meaning. Of it. So I say, Janet, just if, if I can summarize the study so I understand. But if I say, oh, Janet's a visual learner, but everybody else and you know groups of people in here are some different kind of learner, and I do a lesson that emphasizes the visual things, the evidence is I'm not going to we're not going to see improved performance from the so-called visual. No, not any more than, than Janet, than, or, right. or any less than, than Janet. So, at, so right. there are good, there are better and worse okay. ways to teach people things, and, and there are better and worse ways to teach people you know, using different modalities, but they're not going to be differentially better for different subgroups of learners. Okay. It, it helps me a great deal, because I've heard it, but not understood what the, really what the studies are really about. Thank you. I hope that's not too much of a yeah, no, I think that's a, a, a central takeaway, hopefully. Um, yeah, Barbara. So why are you guys, why, I'm just curious, why is it called embodied cognition in the sense that I feel like you're ignoring the ecosystem or the surroundings by having that? I mean, is, has there been any, I mean, you mentioned it, yes, you mentioned it, but in your explanation, there was nothing about the surroundings then that's probably more of a fault with my explanation. So a couple of things. Um, here I'm presenting embodied cognition as one thing that's totally agreed upon. Uh, uh, unfortunately, fortunately, what makes it exciting is that this is an area that has a lot of input from a lot of subfields. Um, artificial intelligence, uh, for example, philosophy, um, cognitive psychology, um, there's work in art and philosophy of art. Um, so all of these uh, different areas will emphasize certain things over others. Um, there's certainly uh, perspectives within artificial intelligence, for example, that place a very high value on the interactions with the environment. Um, and my whole purpose for including the, the stepper there was to hopefully not forget that in thinking about the, the body in isolation, um, because what the uh, implication is, if the environment matters, then the learning environments that we design matter. And that's really important for this project because it's a design-based approach where we are iteratively refining the designs um, as we learn more about what's helpful or not helpful for students. So the, the embodied cognition view doesn't, I don't think, emphasize the environment any more or less than the other views. What's, what's important for the embodied cognition view is the interaction with that environment. So how, how we sense it, how we use our, our perceptual system. It, it, fights against this idea that cognition is amodal. This idea that it doesn't matter how you get the input from the environment, that, uh, it, that it's just information, and that it just comes in, and however it comes in, it's fine. I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about a little bit just as I'm thinking about other stuff that I'm doing, is just how your genetic makeup and, and what actually is expressed and what, what's actually happening to you at the molecular level is really impacted by the environment. So I wanted to give a, a brief glimpse of our simulations, and I think instead of going into too much detail on them, 
um, so that we have time to, to look at the student work like I wanted to, I'll just briefly show some of the, the current state of some of our simulations. Um, so I'll show two of them. Uh, one of the topics we work with students on is understanding gas pressure. And um, what we see here in this simulation for gas pressure is uh, after we engage with students or when we have engaged with students individually in interviews and we've uh, presented a closed syringe, a plastic syringe, and they see that it can be compressed, which surprises some. They see that it's harder to push in as they push it further down, which surprises some. And then when they let go, they see it gets pushed back out. And that's what we're trying to help them explain. So uh, the simulation here involves students in uh, using their hands um, that are going to represent the plunger of the syringe and the molecules. And they're going to interact with it by making collisions between that plunger and the molecules. And what they'll see with the interaction is that when they make more frequent collisions, they're going to see a higher pressure. When they make less frequent collisions, a lower pressure. The other simulation I'll highlight is the season simulation, which might look familiar to conventional simulations, um, but there's a few different gesture interaction mechanisms here. And one of them, if you look in the upper right window, we've got a depiction of some light rays. And what happens is students will use a hand um, that will uh, match the angle of the rays. And relatively speaking, when it matches, it will turn orange. And of course, I'm using a live simulation in a presentation, so. And as they change the angle of the light rays, they'll be able to see other things, um, where the Earth is at and its orbit around the sun, combined with months. They can go back and forth, and they can compare um, what the angle of the light rays looks like during those different times. There's other gesture mechanisms here. I'll show one other one. Um, by using two hands facing each other, they can control the spacing of the rays to try to show that um, for our city, which is the default selected here, the spacing of the rays is further in December, closer together in June. So we're trying to support students in using uh, ideas about the light rays as part of their explanatory models that can help explain the seasons. So just a quick glimpse of uh, what the current status of the simulations is to give a picture of that. One thing I wanted to highlight, if you notice when, when Rob got his hands in position, the hands were there and you could see them, but the found that to be pretty, hopefully you weren't going to talk about this too, but, but we found that to be effective in the sense that, you know, it's, it doesn't provide that distraction and kids are just playing with their hands. Mm -hmm. I know my kids played with that for about, you know, 10, 15 minutes just watching their hands on the screen. But it fades away and then it still allows them to control the simulation which would be interesting. They don't have that distraction, but they still need to have control. At this point, I wanted to give a brief overview of our development process, very brief for year one and two, and then I wanted to spend the bulk of the time talking about the present year and the future. And I wanted to, uh, rather than talk extensively, show uh, short clips that I think encapsulate the first year and the second year especially. Uh, but very brief verbal framing. For year one, uh, on the project, we did individual interviews with middle school students where an interviewer sat down. Um, we brought up the phenomenon that they were able to observe. Um, then we pulled up a conventional simulation on the topic. And then afterwards, we asked them uh, for their explanations. And we were looking at what types of natural gestures they were using with the intent to try to look for the natural gestures that seem to be productive for students, uh, to use those as a source for what would be programmed into the gesture augmented simulations. So it was kind of interesting. She said she didn't know, but when pressed, she did give an explanation, fairly sophisticated explanation. Um, and she was using some gestures as part of that. Um, one of them that you saw, you might recognize as the basis for uh, what was put into the uh, simulation for gas pressure. Um, so that was a big focus on year one. In year two, we had these prototype simulations that could read gestures. 
Um, so we similarly interviewed individual middle school students. Um, we had them use the new simulations and we were interested in looking at their explanations and the extent to which they were using the cue gestures in those explanations. Um, so this is a, a clip um, with uh, Natasha doing an interview. Natasha is also a member of the team. And, uh, she snuck in the back at, at one point there. Um, and I want to point out that uh, this is a, a student um, who is struggling to make sense of this. Um, so Natasha kept pushing her and, and kept pressing her and eventually asked her um, to try to show what she was talking about. Okay, so a student who was struggling and at a certain point um, she was able to pull in that uh, cue gesture as part of her explanation. I'm not up here to uh, claim that she has a full and robust understanding of this, um, but from someone who was stuck, uh, she had an additional resource to use as part of her process for an explanation. Any thoughts or reactions on that one? So um, over the, the last couple of years, um, when we were able to sit down with interviewing individual students, about a half hour, um, we saw that students made quite a bit of progress in their understanding. Um, but I also recognize that it's not a very likely scenario for a classroom where there might be 25 students and one teacher um, and, and not enough attention to go around for a half hour for each individual student. Um, so this year, we're starting to push um, to look at the simulations and how they're used in classroom spaces, in addition to continuing the individual interviews to continue to iterate on the design. Um, so some things I wanted to show from some um, pilot data that I've collected earlier this year um, will be on the, the next couple of slides. And um, I had two students' uh, work that I was going to contrast. I'll probably show one student, um, so maybe we can make a full pass through the uh, trajectory for that student, just to raise some issues and uh, hopefully some uh, discussion. So in a, a classroom setting that I was in, uh, the topic of the seasons was being taught, and the unit was designed as a models-based inquiry unit. This is what I would describe as a best case scenario um, for teaching uh, this particular topic. And um, for one student that we'll look at for uh, Gabe here, um, what I want to point out on a, a pre-assessment um, especially is this diagram here. Um, what he's drawn is the sun in the middle. He's drawn the earth. Uh, he's shown a constant tilt for the earth. I um, mean, he said top half warm, bottom half cold. And I would argue that um, from looking at this, we would say, well, this is a pretty good explanation. This is pretty coherent. So uh, while using the simulation, uh, we had in, in three classes that I looked at, there were two groups of students, and each group usually had three students each in it. Um, so uh, not only are students using the uh, simulations not only individually but with groups, um, they're also not having one interviewer next to them the whole time. You'll see that I interjected at some points. Uh, but um, well, what we had here for Gabe, um, and something I'll point out, uh, uh, corrections were made on top of their original responses. Um, the basic correction that he made was he labeled one part summer that he had said was warmer and uh, one part winter that he said was colder there. Um, we didn't get an integration of the, the light rays here. Um, but I also had an opportunity to ask students for their explanation um, in the supply room that was part of the classroom. And um, at this point, I had asked Gabe to give his explanation. Um, he had given it, basically reiterating that diagram. And I had pushed him a little bit more to help show what he was talking about. Can you do that 
Notice he didn't say anything about light rays, um, but some of the gestures he was using um, looked pretty similar to some of the things that were being shown with the gesture interaction mechanisms in the simulation there. So um, without that uh, contrast between the two students, there were some other things I wanted to highlight, um, but I, I wanted to take a, a brief moment from uh, that snapshot to just mention these challenges and then open it up I think we'll probably have a couple of minutes to discuss where we talk about that specifically um, or any of these things I mentioned for challenges. Um, and if you have some advice, um, I appreciate that. Um, one challenge is just the technical component uh, to be able to do these in full classes. Um, a lot of classes have Chromebooks now, and the LEAP is not supported on them. So that's a technical challenge that we're working with. Uh, there's been logistical challenges where I would like to get permissions back from a, a whole class of students. Um, but unfortunately, um, it's uh, about half was about the best that I can do. And in talking with the teacher afterwards, um, she confirmed that it was probably the, the higher performing students who brought back um, those uh, forms and hence were a part of the, the research. Um, the issue of supporting the teacher and student use, um, I was still in the classroom and able to work with two groups right there, so the teacher didn't have to do a whole lot with them in the, the technology. Um, I created that uh, sheet to help structure students work with the simulation, um, but as you can see, that didn't seem to um, work so well when they were going back and forth between the sheet and the screen. And uh, a point I wanted to make about assessment was when they're asked in different ways about the same topic, they're showing different things about their understanding. So we, we are looking to uh, address several of these um, issues and we have some ideas, but um, I think at this point with the, the re remaining few minutes we have, it open it up for any reflections, uh, discussion, questions. So our, our partners at Concord Consortium actually have the ability to uh, make a digital sort of overlay um, so that instead of having a separate sheet that directs students to try using the simulation in various ways, um, we're going to try uh, to digitally do that um, to guide their, their use through the simulation. Um, one example um, is not only noticing like the angle of the rays, um, but the teacher set up uh, the, the beginning of that unit with that pre-assessment you saw. What the students were trying to explain was um, some data showing a difference between uh, our city and Hastings, New Zealand, which basically showed that we experience warm temperatures while they experience cool temperatures and vice versa. Um, so the ability to easily do that within the simulation is something that our programmers are working on right now to set that custom location and easily go back and forth to make the comparisons. Um, well, this was uh, one teacher where the, the data came from for her three classes, and there was huge buy-in. Um, I, I think a reason for that was the unit was already set up uh, so that essentially we just kind of inserted what we were doing. Um, this shows a, a station where students were engaging in a number of different activities related to explaining the season's phenomenon. and. There was already an interaction with a, a conventional simulation that was on there. Um, so we were able to kind of plop ours into this existing structure. And I think that's why it was so well supported by uh, that teacher. I um, mean, trying to get into other uh, classrooms, we've run into some, some difficulties and it's been a challenge. And I think it's um, because um, if a teacher isn't already using a simulation, then that's already kind of a, a big step to think about how to change the instruction. You know, 
I felt like this kind of tepid response to those kinds of activities. There seemed to be kind of concern with, you know, well, if I allow them to, to do big body movements, are they going to end up hitting people or get out of control? And we actually had people tell us that they were worried about behavioral issues and if we encouraged you know, them to do that in class. Mm -hmm. So the, the simulations themselves seem to be pretty compelling. You know, the, the teachers see them and they, they are really interested in finding ways to use them in the classroom. But there's definitely, I mean, this is, it's a new paradigm. So there's definitely some, some concern and reservation. I think the important part was that, as you said, this is already something that was part of her classroom, and here with other teachers, you know, they're already tasked with, you know, this is my schedule for the year, and if this and anything else, um, you know, and I can't fit anything else in because I ran into that on the spring and the meal trip one. I didn't get that stuff in. So I think it was an advantage that she found somebody who was uh, tasked with doing that since early on. Absolutely. So I, I did glance at the clock and see that our official time is up, um, but I'm more than happy to, to hang around and chat with anyone uh, who will uh, give me the pleasure of doing so. I wanted to say thanks for uh, everyone for stopping by. Appreciate it. Thank you.